In chapter 12 of Eat, Drink, and Be Healthy, what did you mean by the planet's health matters too? The planet's health is really intertwined with human health, that we can't have healthy people, healthy populations on a sick planet. And we are making our planet sick at this time at an increasing rate. And that's a, a huge concern. Uh, and I've spent my life looking at diet and human health in a very direct way, what, how what we eat affects our health. But I have to say at this point in time, the more urgent problem is actually our planet's health. Because if we can't get that right, uh, no matter what we tell people to do or advise people to do uh, about their diets, uh, it's not going to be possible to have healthy populations uh, on our planet. Uh, the uh, and particularly concerning is the rapid acceleration of climate change over the last few decades. We are on track to disaster at this point in time. Uh, the uh, where the uh, United Nations uh, uh, Committee on Climate Change has uh, identified a path to keeping climate uh, to keeping temperature increases to less than two degrees centigrade uh, by the end of the century. Uh, we're on track for double that uh, increase in temperature, which will be devastating. Uh, uh, that 2100 seems a long ways away, but actually our grandkids will be alive at that time. So it's not that far away. And uh, they're gonna look back at us, at our uh, generation, say, what did you do about this? Now, hopefully they'll look in our history books and say, this was a turning point. We paid attention to the science. We had some sacrifices. We made major changes and we redirected the pathway we're following. But that's not what is happening right now. And I am afraid our generation will be judged poorly. Are cancers caused by environmental and diet factors or are they genetically determined? Our risk of cancer is determined by many different factors. There's been a lot of interest recently about genetics determining cancer risk. And uh, partly that's hot because it's new science, it's interesting, it's high technology, and we are learning some new things. But uh, the major factors influencing cancer rates are not due to genetics. And I'm afraid that the emphasis has become unbalanced at this point in time. And we know that the uh, rates of major cancers are not determined by genetic reasons primarily uh, because of studies that were done 50 and 60 years ago looking at migrating populations from low-risk countries, <coughs> say uh, for uh, Japan for breast cancer risk and risk of colorectal cancer. We know that those populations, when they came to the United States, had huge increases in their rates of uh, uh, breast cancer, and colon cancer, uh, some other cancers as well. And that really proves that it's not genetic factors that are primarily underlying the high risks of these cancers that we experience today. And even in Japan, uh, the rates of uh, colon cancer, for example, have been skyrocketing during the same period of time. And they've actually, their rates of colon cancer have caught up with those of the United States, uh, in part because our rates have been going down, their rates have been going up. Uh, and uh, it's an interesting question why our rates have been going down. A lot of that has probably been improvements in diet, uh, including uh, increased uh, folic acid. Uh, some of that's been through fortification and supplements. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, we've had about a 40-50% reduction in red meat since the 1970s, too. And that's probably contributed to the uh, declining rates of colorectal cancer in the United States. But we can't take that as a uh, sit back and say we've d done what we needed to do because we've become fat. And that fat is, uh, obesity is driving colon cancer rates back up again in younger generations in the United States. So uh, cancer rates are, uh, they, they seem sort of risk of cancer. We've had the perception that they've been sort of fixed, inevitable due to genetics. No, cancer rates are very modifiable. Uh, and that's why uh, research on what are the factors that we need to modify has been incredibly important. And for many cancers, we have identified uh, uh, ways that we can change the risk to a, a very substantial uh, extent, but not for all cancers. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, and particularly, I would say for breast cancer among young women, uh, that's a disease that has often been occurring uh, in women who think and, uh, they're doing everything right. And in fact, who have been doing everything right by everything we know. Uh, and so there's a lot yet to be learned 
uh, we've has, we do have some strong clues coming that uh, the diet during high school years is particularly important for breast cancer. Uh, and uh, that is probably explaining why uh, a lot of women are developing breast cancer for reasons that are uh, not understandable. Uh, uh, yes, genetics plays a role. And there are some genetic variants, such as uh, BRCA1 mutations, where the risk is, of cancer is extremely high. And we need to pay, pay uh, special attention to uh, people who have these fortunately uncommon mutations. Uh, that, that's a real medical uh, issue that needs to be uh, addressed and managed by uh, genetic counselors and, and physicians. So there's no single answer to this. Genes have a role. Uh, for some people, they have a very big role. Fortunately, that's rare. But uh, much of the cancer risk is potentially avoidable. And for many cancers, we do know how to very dramatically reduce the risk uh, that applies to colorectal cancer, for example. What's the difference to our health from refined carbohydrates versus complex carbohydrates? Uh, we found that the type of carbohydrate is uh, very important. There was a sort of party line, I must say, not too long ago, that all carbohydrates are the same but they're not the same. If we just look at them one meal, uh, we have a very different response to, uh, say, a highly refined carbohydrate product like uh, something made out of white flour, uh, white bread, for example, or uh, white rice. Uh, uh, we uh, break that carbohydrate, that the, basically starch molecules, uh, into glucose molecules very quickly. We are the enzymes in our digestive system break this uh, long chain of glucose molecules, which is what starch is, into glucose that we very quickly absorb. So our blood sugar goes skyrocketing up after consuming uh, something like white bread. But if we have something that's a whole grain, minimally processed uh, uh, form of carbohydrate, like our wheat berries, for example, uh, or other intact whole grains, then it's sort of like a time release capsule that the coating uh, over the uh, grains uh, delays the absorption, the, the, break, uh, the access of those enzymes to the starch breaks, uh, slows down the uh, digestion of uh, starch into glucose molecules. And so we get a much slower, much smaller rise in blood glucose. And uh, we see that that does translate to risk of diabetes, for example, lower risk of type 2 diabetes with uh, the whole grain uh, intact kind of low glycemic carbohydrates compared to eating a lot of refined starches or potatoes, uh, which uh, contain a form of carbohydrate that is also very rapidly con uh, converted to blood glucose. So the type of starch in our diet does make a, a big difference uh, just in one meal, and that translates into risk of type 2 diabetes if we eat that kind of high-risk diet uh, meal after meal, year after year. Is there a big difference in the type of sugar we consume? Mm -hmm. There's been a lot of interest in uh, the type of sugar uh, that, uh, in particular, whether uh, fructose has some particularly adverse uh, uh, consequences in terms of disease risk. Uh, but th the biggest form of sugar, table sugar, sucrose, is actually one molecule of fructose, one molecule of glucose. And we separate those, so we're getting equal amounts of fructose and uh, uh, glucose when we eat sugar. The high fructose corn syrup has a little more fructose compared to glucose, uh, and, uh, but the differences are really minor. So the difference between high fructose corn syrup and sucrose is, uh, is almost certainly very minimal and, and, and not important. Uh, fructose is interesting. It, does, it is handled metabolically uh, differently than glucose uh, in some ways, but it also in some ways is similar. Uh, that, so there seem to be adverse effects of both glucose and fructose if consumed in high amounts. But in general, whether we're high fructose uh, corn syrup versus uh, regular table sugar, is uh, the, the difference is very minimal. Keeping the amounts of both low is desirable. Uh, the fructose that we get naturally in fruits uh, it doesn't seem to be a, a serious issue if we don't really overdo uh, our fruit uh, consumption. Uh, uh, we're, Part of it is that when we eat the fructose in the form of fruit, we are slowing down the absorption uh, just because it's part of an intact food. And also, of course, there are many other micronutrients and phytochemicals that are coming along with the sugar and, and uh, natural fruits that have uh, positive benefits. So when we uh, look at, at fruits, fruit consumption in general, we don't see 
uh, adverse effects like we do see consuming uh, uh, refined sugar as we would get from uh, table sugar, uh, particularly adverse when we consume it in the form of beverages like a soda. And that's a lot to do with the amounts that we, and a standard 20 ounce uh, serving of soda, we get somewhere around 16, 17 teaspoons of sugar. Uh, can, uh, people can just gulp that down and go for another and our body just can't handle that metabolically.